Good morning. The topic for today's seminar is Removal Orthodontic Appliances and will be covered under the following headings. So what is a removable orthodontic appliance? They are appliances that can be inserted and removed from the oral cavity by patient at will or by the orthodontist for adjustment. It could be classified as intraoral under which we have the simple appliances like the oral screen and the inclined plate or a unimaxillary plate appliances for maxilla or mandible which is the active plate or the retention plate or it could be extra oral or a combination of both. Moving on to the advantages, it causes tipping movement, it can be removed for cleaning of teeth and the appliance, it can be removed if there is pain, it is less conspicuous, it can be undertaken by general practitioner with adequate training, it could be manufactured in the lab so it gives less chair side time and more patients can be treated and it's inexpensive. Moving on to the disadvantages, only simple malocclusions can be corrected, multiple rotations cannot be corrected, uncooperative patients may leave, uh, leave the appliance out, it may prolong the treatment, multiple tooth movement will not be possible and the lower appliance are generally not well tolerated. Moving on to the components, it has an active component, a retentive component and a base plate. We will be first discussing the active components. The active components are the bows, the springs, the screws and the elastics. Moving on to the bows, so first is the labial bow. So labial bow are essential components and can be active or passive. Moving on to the parts of the labial bow, it has an incisor segment, vertical loops, the crossover section and the retentive arm. Uses is used to move the teeth lingually holds the lip away from the teeth, support for soldered springs, bar loops or for hooks to attach elastic bands to move individual teeth. The friction of labial wire against the anterior teeth act as a clasp to enhance the fit of the plate. Moving on to the various types of labial bows, they are short labial bow, long labial bow, split labial bow, reverse labial bow, Roberts retractor, Mills retractor, high labial bow with apron springs and fitted labial bow. We'll be discussing each of this in detail. Moving on to the short label bow, it's constructed using a 0.7 mm hard round stainless steel wire. As seen in the diagram, the retentive arm is distal to the canine. It is very stiff and exhibits low flexibility. It is indicated in case of minor overjet reduction and anterior space closure. Also for retention at the end of orthodontic therapy. It is activated by compressing the U-loops. Moving on to the long labial bow, from the picture we can see that it extends from one first premolar to the other pre uh, first premolar on the opposite side. It is indicated in minor anterior space closure, minor overjet reduction, closure of space distal to canine and retention after fixed orthodontic therapy. Moving on to split label bow, it is split in the middle and it is two separate buckle lamps having U-loops. It gives increased flexibility to this appliance. It's indicated for anterior retraction and it's a modified form for closure of midline diastema. It is activated by compressing the U-loop 1 to 2 mm at a time. Moving on to reverse label bow, it's also called as reverse loop label bow. The U-loops are placed distal to the canine and the free ends of the U-loop are adapted occlusally between the first premolar and canine. Its indication is similar to the short label bow and it's activated in two steps. The first, the U-loop is opened which results in the lowering of the label bow in the incisor region and secondly, a compensatory bend is given at the base of the U-loop to maintain a proper level of the bow. Moving on to high label bow with apron springs, consists of heavy label bow of 0.9 mm or 1 mm thickness that extends into the vestibule. Apron springs made of 0.4 mm wire are attached to the high label bow. Its uses, it can be designed for retraction of one or more teeth 
and used in cases of large overjet due to increased flexibility of this. Activation Apron springs is activated by bending it towards the teeth. Disadvantages It's difficult to construct and also there is an increased risk of soft tissue injury. Moving on to fitted label bow, wires adapted to confirm to the contours of the label surfaces. The U-loop is small, used only as a retainer as it cannot bring about active tooth movement. Robert's Retractor It's a flexible bow constructed from 0.5 mm diameter wire inserted into a stainless steel tubing to give support at the end of the bow as it lacks stability. It consists of a coil of 3 mm diameter mesial to canine. It's indicated in patients having severe proclination with an overjet of over 4 mm. The activation, the bow is adjusted by bending it in the vertical limb below the coil. As the incisor moves palatally, the bow will drop anteriorly at the level of the horizontal part, which should be adjusted. Moving on to Mills Retractor, it's called as Extended Label Bow. It has an extensive looping of the wire, so it increases the flexibility. Indicated with patients with large overjet, the disadvantage is the difficulty in construction and the poor patient acceptability due to the complex design. Moving on to springs. Springs are the active components of the removal orthodontic appliances that are used to affect various tooth movements. It could be classified on the basis of the presence and absence of a helix, so that would be simple and compound. And based on the nature of stability of the spring, that is the self-supported springs which are made up of a thicker gauge wire and supported springs which are made of a thinner gauge wire. It could also be classified as the presence of loops or helix, that is helical springs and loop springs. The following are the ideal requisites of a spring. It should be simple to fabricate, easy to adjust, should fit in properly, should not cause any discomfort, should apply adequate force, should remain active for the longest period and should be robust, easy to clean. Moving on to the force system delivered, so it basically depends on the intrinsic property and the extrinsic property. The intrinsic property cannot be altered by the operator, that is the modulus of elasticity and the yield strength. However, the extensive property, that is the length of the wire and the thickness of the wire. It, so we are aware of this equation that the force dissipated will be equal to diameter raised to 4 by the length raised to 3. So the length of the wire, as it increases, it reduces the force, while the thickness of the wire, as it increases, it reduces the flexibility and will increase the force. So small changes in diameter and length have a profound impact on the force delivered. Moving on to the type of springs, that is first will be the single cantilever spring, also called as the finger spring. The indication, it is used for mesiodistal movement of the teeth, can be used only on those teeth that are located correctly in the buccolingual direction, that is the teeth should be within the line of the arch. The parts, the finger spring consists of an active arm of 12 to 15 mm length towards the tissue, the helix of not more than 3 mm internal diameter, a retentive arm of 4 to 5 mm which is kept away from the tissues and ends in a small retentive tag. The activation, the finger spring is activated by moving the active arm towards the teeth to be moved, should be done as close to the coil as possible. Activation up to 3 mm is considered ideal when 0.5 mm wire is used and when 0.6 mm wire is used, half of that is used. Moving on to the double cantilever spring, also known as the Z spring. The indication, the labial movement of single incisor or both to bring about minor rotations. The activation by, both, by opening both the helices by about 2 to 3 mm at a time or in case of minor rotation, only one helix is opened. Moving on to T-spring, indicated when a premolar or a canine has to be moved buccally, activated by pulling the free ends of the T towards the intended direction of the tooth movement. The coffin spring was introduced by Walter Coffin. It's a removable type of expansion spring. So it's indicated to use 
indicated to bring about slow transverse dental alveolar arch expansion in case of unilateral cross bites. The construction, made up of 1.25 mm hard stainless steel wire, consists of a U or a omega shaped wire placed in the mid palatal region with retentive arms incorporated in the base plate. Appliance gets retention from Adams class on molars and premolars. So, this is the diagram. It's activated by pulling the sides apart manually, first in the premolar region and then in the molar region. Activation of 1 to 2 mm at a time is appropriate. Moving on to U loop canine retractors, it is made up of 0.6 or 0.7 mm wire. It consists of a U loop, active arm, and a retentive arm. Mesial arm of the U loop is bent at right angles and adapted around the canine below its contact point. The base of U loop should be 2 to 3 mm below the cervical margin, used when minimal retraction of 1 to 2 mm is required. Activation by closing the loops by 1 to 2 mm or cutting the free end of an active arm by 2 mm and readapting it. The palatal canine retractor is made of 0.6 mm stainless steel wire, consists of a coil of 3 mm diameter, an active arm and a retentive arm. The active arm is placed mesial to canine. Helix is placed along the axis of the canine. It's indicated in retraction of canine that is palatally placed. The activation by opening the helix 2 mm at a time. Reverse loop buckle retractor, also called as a helical canine retractor, favored when the sulcus is shallow, as in case of lower arch, made of 0.6 mm wire, consists of 3 mm diameter, an active arm, and a retentive arm. The mesial arm is adapted between the premolars, the distal arm is active and bent at right angles to engage canine below the height of the contour. Coil is placed 3 mm below the gingival margin. The activation, it should not be activated more than 2 mm. This is done by cutting off 1 mm of the wire from the free end and reaffirming it to engage the mesial surface of the tooth. Alternatively, it can be done by opening the helix by 1 mm. The buckle self-supported canine retractor, it's constructed with 0.7 mm wire, called self-supported because it is made of thicker diameter wire than that which will resist distortion. Consists of a helix of 3 mm in diameter and an active arm and a retentive arm. Coil lies just distal to the long axis of the tooth. The anterior limb passes down from the coil to the middle of the crown and passes around the mesial contact area. It's used in case of buccally placed canine or in case of canine placed high in the vestibule. Only spring activated by closing the coil. The active arm is away from the tissues to avoid impingement of the soft tissues while the coil lies towards the tissues. The activation is done by closing the helix. Moving on to elastics. Elastics are the active components seldom used with removable appliances. May be used for the movement of single teeth, tooth or a group of teeth and for intermaxillary traction. Their application was greatly enhanced by introduction of arrowhead clasp and modification of Adams class. The orthodontic screws. Orthodontic screw is an active component of removable appliances that together with acrylic plates can affect the teeth and alveolar process. The screws were introduced by Schwartz. Moving on to the retentive components of a removable appliances, it's mainly done by the clasps. They are the retentive components that resist the displacement of orthodontic appliances by contacting the surface of the tooth or by engaging the undercuts. It could be classified into single arm clasps like the C clasps or the triangular clasps or double arm clasps which are the U clasp and the Adams clasps. Moving on to the mo mode of action, they act by engaging the constricted areas of the teeth called undercuts. There are two types, there are buccal and lingual undercuts or mesial and distal proximal undercuts. The following are the requirements of an ideal clasp. Should offer adequate retention, should permit usage in both fully as well as partially erupted teeth, should not apply any active force by themselves, should not interfere with normal occlusion, should not impinge the soft tissues. 
Moving on to the circumferential clasp, also ca called the C clasp or the three quarter clasps. It engages the buccal cervical undercut. The wire is engaged from one proximal undercut along the cervical margin, then carried over the occlusal margin to end as a single retentive tag on the lingual side. The advantage is its simplicity in design and fabrication. Disadvantage cannot be used in partially erupted teeth. It is made of thicker wire, hence it's very rigid. The Jackson's clasp, introduced by Jackson in 1906, also called the full clasp or the U-clasp, engages the buccal cervical undercut and the mesiodistal undercut. Advantage is it's easy to construct and there's adequate retention. Disadvantage, inadequate retention in partially erupted teeth. The Crozet clasp, it resembles a full clasp but has an addi additional piece of wire soldered which engages into the mesial and distal proximal undercut. Offers better retention than full clasp. The triangular clasp, introduced by Zimmer in 1949, used between two adjacent posterior teeth, engages the proximal undercut. Is indicated when additional retention is required. The triangle as a rule fits horizontally into the interdental space. The open end is towards the teeth. Moving on to the southern clasp, used when retention is needed in anterior region. Wire adapted along the cervical margins of both the central incisors. The distal end is carried over the occlusal embrasures on the palatal side as retentive arms. The ball and clasp, fabricated using wires having ball-like structures at one end. The ball can be made at the end of the wire using silver solder. Preform wires having ball at one end are also available. The ball engages the proximal undercut between two posterior teeth, indicated when additional retention is required. Moving on to the Dysing's clasp, made by two wires emerging from the plate to cross the occlusion over the anterior and posterior contact point of the tooth clasped. Then each wire goes above the greater circumference of the tooth to the midline of the tooth and then back again below using the undercut. Moving on to the Schwartz clasp, clasp also called as the arrowhead clasp. It is said to be the predecessor of the Adams clasp. It has the following parts, the arrowhead portion, the vestibular portion and the retentive arms. The following are its advantages. The wire between the arrowhead makes it more elastic. The possibility of adjusting the arrows slightly mesial or distal, used both on deciduous and permanent teeth, facilitates teeth to erupt in position. The disadvantages, needs a special type of plier, occupies a large amount of space, arrowhead can cause soft tissue damage, it's difficult and time consuming to fabricate. Moving on to Adam's clasp, described by Philip Adam, also known as Liverpool clasp, universal clasp and modified arrowhead clasp. Constructed using a 0.7 mm hard stainless steel wire. Has the following parts, two arrowheads, the bridge and the two retentive arms. The two arrowheads engage the mesial and the distal proximal undercut. The arrowheads are connected to each other by a bridge which is at 45 degrees to the long axis of the tooth. Corrected, co correct, correctly constructed Adam clasp should be passive but in contact with the tooth surface when the appliance is fully inserted. Adam's clasp has the following advantages. It is rigid and offers excellent retention, can be fabricated on both deciduous and permanent dentition, can be used on partially or fully erupted teeth, can be used on molars, premolars and incisors. No specialized instrument needed to fabricate the clasp. It is small and occupies minimum space and clasp can be modified in various ways. These are the essential features of Adam's clasp. The, as seen in the figure, the bridge has to be straight. The arrowheads are parallel. The bridge stands away from the tooth at an angle of 45 degrees. The tags are formed by turning down at right angles. The clasp should be passive but in contact with the teeth when fully inserted. Should not exert any force as it can tip the tooth. Coming on to the modifications, the first one is Adam with a single arrowhead, indicated in a partially erupted tooth, usually the last erupted molar. Arrowhead is made to engage the mesioproximal undercut of the last erupted molar. 
bridge is modified to encircle the tooth distally and ends on the palatal aspect as a retentive arm. Then we have Adam's class with a J-hook. As you can see in the diagram, at the bridge there is a J-hook. Adam's with incorporated helix. Again in the diagram you can see at, along the bridge a helix is incorporated. Adam's with sold out buckle tube. This permits the use of extra oral anchorage using face bow or headgear assembly. Adam's with distal extension. Adam's on incisors and premolars. Adam's with additional arrowhead. The additional arrowhead engages the proximal undercut of the adjacent tooth and is soldered on the bridge. This offers additional retention. Adam's clasp on rotated teeth. Made in the usual way, the bridge of the clasp should be in line with the buccal segment and not with the buccal surface of the tooth. Moving on to the last component, that is the base plate. It forms the framework of the removal appliances. It functions as a component that unites all the comp uh, 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 it unites all the components into a single unit, helps in anchoring, provides support for Y components, helps in distributing the forces over a large area. Bite planes ca can be incorporated. The materials used could be heat cure or self cure. Heat cure has more color stability, less porosity, and higher strength, while self cure is more convenient faster action, less cost and possible for repair. Moving on to few appliances which are commonly used. That first would be a Holly's appliance. It is designed by Charles Holly in 1908, which is the most frequently used retainer. It consists of a short label bow and Adam's clasp on the molars. You can appreciate that in the diagram that there are Adam's clasp on both molars and anterior if you see, we see a label bow and then the acrylic plate which holds the entire unit. Moving on to Catalan's appliance. It was con given more than 200 years ago. It is used to treat anterior crossbite. So there is a 45 degree angulation to the occlusal plane which guides the upper incisor to position labially. It is indicated when incisors are in early stage of eruption. If used for more than 6 weeks, anterior open bite may be resulted. May need frequent cementation. Moving on to delivery of the appliance. The following points must be noted when the appliance is delivered. Check for any roughness on fitting surface. Carry out adjustment to acrylic base to ensure the fit is adequate. Adjust any springs and test the functioning of the screws. Class should be examined for adequate retention made to engage the undercut. No components should impinge upon gingiva, the sulcus or the frenum. The following instructions should be given to the patient. Instructions to the patient about insertion and removal about how it's done. That is demonstration with the help of a mirror. Clear instruction regarding the wearing of the appliance. If necessary, should be given in writing. Most appliances are to be worn both day and night. Both the appliance and the teeth should be cleaned after every meal and before going to sleep. Patient is asked to clean the appliance using detergent solution and a brush. Care should be taken not to bend or dislodge any of the components of the appliance. In case of appliances that incorporate screws, the patient should be told about the activation schedule. Patients are instructed to report to the clinic in case of any damage. The patient should not leave the appliance out of the mouth for a long period as it increases the loss and damage. Thank you.